Good morning, everyone. My name is Megan Combe. I'm the executive director of the Boston University Wheelock Educational Policy Center, and I'm so honored to get to open our meeting this morning. Yesterday evening, we hosted the first day of the BU Wheelock Annual Forum and are excited to be back in a virtual space today with a community of alumni, faculty, staff, partners, and a much broader community of stakeholders, all committed and focused on the quality and diversity of the educator workforce. While last night we focused on the research policies and teacher experience connected with the Massachusetts educator workforce and teaching specifically amidst the pandemic. Today, we will expand our conversations more nationally in scope, but we'll also narrow the focus to talk about the specific ways that policy and research differentiates or could to highlight the experiences and outcomes associated with two important subpopulations of students, English learners and students with disabilities. And in particular, we'll focus on the ways that these policies shape the experiences for teachers that serve them and their families. One thing to note about the theme for the, for the day is that part of our reason for choosing it was because we believe not enough is being done in this critical area both on the research and policy front. The Wheelock Educational Policy Center launched last year here at BU, focused with a mission on engaging in rigorous and relevant research in partnership with state and district education leaders. As we look out on the landscape, we see a bit of a gap. On the one hand, there's a long track record of really robust research supporting students with disabilities specifically by examining specific programs and interventions though often these studies exist at a fairly small scale. What is really just emerging is the evaluation and study of the larger systems and policies that affect the day-to-day -day work in our schools and classrooms, specific to the experiences, needs, and outcomes of English learners and students with disabilities, who not only have a different set of policy constraints governing their schooling experience, but are certainly differentially impacted by policies which are generally designed for edu general education students and settings. We think this, is, this needs to change. And while we've begun research partnerships on this front, some of which you'll hear about today, we also wanted to leave space to discuss and consider more about what can and should be done as we seek to close the historic and widening gaps for these students. So on screen, what you can see here is an outline of the discussion that we hope to facilitate today. We'll start by welcoming Juliana Erdeby, 2021 National Teacher of the Year, as our keynote speaker, who will help to set a meaningful frame for our thinking about the day. Next, we'll move into two rounds of research presentations and discussions. We've organized these sessions to spotlight briefly some of the research aligned with our theme, but also prioritized leaving time and space for a discussion with the policy and practice leaders navigating these decisions connected to many of the findings that will be shared. And then finally, we'll welcome Assistant Secretary for Planning, Evaluation, and Policy Development at the US Department of Education, Roberto Rodriguez, for a final keynote and a closing panel discussion. It's certainly a full four hours of programming, uh, although we have tried to work in some breaks between the, the different research breakout sessions. And we're really appreciative of the time that you're spending with us this morning, or if you're watching the recordings of this webinar later on from the comfort of your own time and space, we're also grateful to have you with us. Before we begin, just a few logistics about our webinar format as we go into today's session. First, we are running in webinar mode. Uh, panelists who will join off and on throughout the day have their own unique links and will be asked to turn their cameras on and off during various segments of the event, either to join the discussions or to sit back and participate as participants. Second, we've enabled the chat function and encourage everyone to engage in the conversation alongside our agenda. There is someone from our team monitoring the chat and helping to elevate themes and comments from that conversation within the course of the dialogue happening within the webinar itself. 
But that said, if you have a specific question you'd like to be addressed, we'd really appreciate it if you'd utilize the Q&A function. This will be the primary spot where we will turn to directly during the Q&A segments of our agenda and really will be the best way for your question to be addressed. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, Juliana Erdeby, who's the 2021 National Teacher of the Year. As National Teacher of the Year, um, she spends the year getting to engage throughout the country with educators and other uh, policy leaders around an agenda that she sets forth and designs. And she's spending this year in particular advocating for a joyous and just edu education for all students that both celebrates their families, their identities, as well as their communities. She's a nationally, nationally board certified teacher she is known as Miss Earth with her students and community for her efforts to beautify the school and unify the community through murals and gardens, some of which you'll see during her uh, keynote today. Uh, importantly, within the context of our theme, she's also a special education co-teacher in Las Vegas and brings a wealth of knowledge and own personal experience at, as we talk about the students uh, uh, that we're we're focused on today. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to a pre-recorded video. She wasn't able to make it in person, um, but nonetheless, um, a keynote opening from Juliana. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much to the Wheel Lock Education Policy Center for bringing us all together. Um, today to focus on how we can center teacher voice um, to move forward and to bring equity forward in policy and educational research. So a joyous and just education, um, really, I think that when I look deep on all the levels of a joyous and just education, I think teachers trusting their expertise and their leadership from within the classroom is definitely intertwined with being able to create a joyous and just education. I think that when policymakers and researchers are able to, you know, put an ear to the ground and see echoes of a joyous and just education, um, I'm really curious about the impact it can have on all of our work. So I am so proud to be a national board certified teacher. I certified in the area of exceptional needs, birth to 21. Um, and for me, my national board certification really helped me believe in that teacher voice. It helped me uh, believe in my expertise, that I was the expert in who my students were, what their needs were, both academic, social, and emotional, and how they were responding to my instruction based on those needs. I realized what um, community was all about because the National Board really asked you to ensure that you understood our students and their families. And so it, I see the intersections between teachers seeing themselves as these experts and then the advocacy and work that we do. Um, so today I really want to share with you all a little bit about how I co-constructed a garden with my community and because of that process of transforming space um, we were able to really play out these elements of a joyous and just education wasn't perfect, but we did it together. So today I'm gonna to take you through a little bit of a journey of my story, my leadership um, experience this last year, and show you uh, how and some pictures of the garden. First, I wanna take a second and recognize all of the educators as they were named People Magazine's People of the Year in December of 2021. I was honored to um, be asked to be on the cover, and I was nervous about it because I didn't know how the celebration was gonna hit teachers. And I saw teachers being very excited. On social media, I would see teachers tagging other teachers and say, hey, so-and-so, congratulations for being named person of the year. And also I would see people um, saying, teachers saying, oh, I'm gonna add this to my resume. I'm so excited to be a person of the year. And that's really what this magazine cover represents. It represents all of us and our collective work into improving the outcomes for all children. I sincerely think that it takes all of us to be able to um, mitigate change. 
I think the most powerful place of change is a classroom because nowhere else can you see such immediate change. And so I think we need to pour resources, um, grant expertise to the people doing that work. So thank you all, every single educator and leader in the field. Know that um, our interdependence is ultimately what will uh, prescribe our future. And so I think that this is a great call for teachers and policymakers and researchers to collaborate. Uh, I want to share a little story um, that has helped me develop a metaphor for how I perceive change in the field. So in October, I got to go to the White House um, and make a speech in the, uh, the lawn of the White House in front of the 2020 and the 2021 Teachers of the Year, as well as President Biden and Dr. Biden and our Secretary Cardona and the live CNN world feed. Um, and I was so nervous because I struggle with public speaking anxiety. And um, I was doing my best to get through my speech and I get to the part where I'm going to highlight and honor my school communities and I freeze. And I don't know if I froze for three seconds or three minutes, but I was so moved by the momentous occasion, by the emotions I feel for my students and their families, by the honor, um, by the gravity of being the first Latina, the first teacher from Nevada, the third special education teacher, all of these things were hitting me. And as I was freezing in front of live TV, um, I suddenly feel an embrace. And it's Dr. Biden who's put her arm around me and has whispered to me, it's going to be OK. So immediately I snap out of it and I tell the audience, Dr. Biden said it's going to be OK, so it's going to be OK. And I was able to persevere through the rest of my speech. After the speech, we were waiting for Secret Service to come help us off the stage. And I took the opportunity to look to Dr. Biden and tell her, thank you, you saved me. And she kind of gave me this teachery look and say, mm -mm, I didn't save you. You don't need to be saved. Your story is important. And I hope that you keep telling it. It's perfect the way it is. And in that moment in time, something switched in my brain where I no longer felt this whelm of anxiety when I had to speak because now I was conveying my story. Um, and so I appreciated that moment significantly not because now I'm able to get through speeches, but also because of this metaphor of what happens when we truly embrace teachers, right? When we tell them that they matter, that what they do is enough, and when we agree to walk this walk with them, right? So Dr. Biden, being a fellow educator, this was really transformative for me in my practice. I agree with her. Education doesn't just make us smarter. It has the ability to make us whole. And I wonder what elements need to be put in place for students, their families, and teachers to feel whole as we participate in public education. I love this anchoring quote about why, being a, why be a star when you can make a constellation. For me, the work is about collective wellness. It's about collective learning because I've learned along the way, my students have taught me that nobody loses when you empower each member of a community. Sometimes it's just a matter of making space, holding space, rethinking your space, and really being critical about access to resources. I want to share briefly my story so you can see where Joyce and Just Education came from. I was born in Bogota, Colombia during the height of the Civil War. Inside of my home, safety, wonder, awe, love. Outside of my home, violence and um, some really present dangers. And so, like so many of my families or my students, families, my family had to make the decision to leave our home country. When we arrived in the United States, the school that we were supposed to felt unwelcoming to my mom. It felt un un unsafe because it was gray and there was metal detectors. And so I wonder in that moment what propelled my mom forward. And I think I understand it. She wanted her daughters to have an education that not only connected us to our languages, our culture, our proximity to family and community, but also to have a deep love for learning. She perceived at that first school that that wasn't going to be possible. So my parents, you know, went out of their comfort zone to find us a bilingual magnet program that would accept us. Only it wasn't that easy. In order for us to be accepted, my parents had to offer support to the school. And so luckily my mom was able to teach Spanish classes and my dad music classes. And that literally changed my sisters and I, our, our education. And while I'm so deeply grateful to my parents for their this level of advocacy, 
Um, I know that an equitable education is something all students should have access to. It's not something families should have to fight for. And it's this concept that drove me to become an educator, an educator who ensured to see the brilliance in every single child and every single family. And so what is a joyous and just education? Well, joy is different than happiness because joy comes from within um, and it's something that's uh, a part of who you are. It comes from having a deep sense of belonging. Brene Brown says that belonging is the opposite of fitting in. And I wonder if like me, many of my students have felt like they just have to fit into a system that hopes to assimilate for ease, um, that doesn't mind when we lose our first languages, our home languages. Um, and instead, I believe that in order to find joy, you need to know who you are. You need to know who you are in relation to your community and know that you have a value to your community. The only way we can do this is by centering who our students are. Now, Just Education acknowledges that there are many barriers of access and inequities that we need to redesign, that we need to rethink. And I think that it's only possible when we look to our students for that kind of support, for their input about what feels good at school, what's fair, what's unfair, what would they like to see more in school? Not only listening to them, but really um, facilitating the process so that they can be part of that, those changes, those shifts. It's about valuing collaboration over compliance. I really truly believe that joy and justice can be a bridge into change. And so I have five pillars that I believe um, really help us see our design frameworks as more intentional and holistic, um, ensuring that our students and their families' voices are a key part of the educational ecosystem. The first is that inclusion is a key part of this and that inclusion is the first thing we plan for. And I'm not just talking about inclusion of people with learning and thinking differences with special education eligibilities. I'm not just talking about first generation families or people of color or um, folks whose preferred language is not English. Um, I'm talking about anybody who doesn't experience a deep sense of welcome or success or joy in their uh, schooling experience. And we plan first for those folks to fit in, uh, well, to transcend fitting in into a sense of belonging. Next, I think that we need to be really intentional um, and know that we're powerful enough to reframe our reality. I don't like to use the term linguistically or English language learner. I like to use the term linguistically gifted because it fully captures our students and their families um, gifts that they give to our school and our school learning community. There's no qualifiers on being linguistically gifted. This is my student, Vanessa. Um, she was rated a one out of six on her English language learner development. But then I found out that her first language was American Sign Language. Um, she learned Tagalog with one grandmother, Spanish with another, and then acquired English at school. I remember the rage that I felt when I saw a one out of six because our school was not able to appropriately identify her gifts. And what she inspired me to do is to have this shift. Um, I know that for me, the term English language learner was never big enough for my family's gifts, for my community's gifts. The next is the heart of a joyous and just education. And this is that we are intentional and we prioritize intergenerational learning, meaning that we acknowledge and uplift the learning of our students, families and community members within school spaces. Sometimes this is best done during informal spaces, but that this really matters. Next is to have an asset mindset grounded in social justice, meaning that our work can bring change. One of the ways I like to think about this is seeing high school students who perhaps are undocumented um, or have DACA and seeing them as future teachers and saying, hey, we're gonna work with you to make your higher education more accessible, your certification process in your state more accessible, more sustainable, and also paths to residency for folks who are undocumented and wanna become teachers and um, through their teaching service, then they earn their residency and their um, citizenship. I believe that we have to greet each member of our community with an asset mindset always. Next is this concept of holistic learning, right? We cannot separate our students' academic learning from their social and emotional learning. And I feel like this is something that is coming to front to mind more after the COVID-19 pandemic. I found great ease of doing this in the garden where my students could learn based on their observation, their intuition, and each other. 
So I alluded to this wonderful garden that we were able to build with our community. And really this garden was started um, as a way of communicating to our community. We care about you. We care about the well-being of your child. We recognize what an honor and gift it is to be your child's teacher. We want the space to be welcoming and fitting for us all to learn together. And so we started throwing up murals once we ran out of garden space for murals um, everywhere around the school because we wanted our students not just to see themselves reflected, but also celebrated. We built the garden slowly, but together. Our students and their families had input every single step of the way, and we met with them to make sure that we understood their dynamic needs and strengths, and so that we could incorporate that into our planning. Collectively, we raised over $80,000, and each penny went to ensuring that our knowings, our students had access and lived a joyous and just education. Ultimately, what I think made the garden so special was that it was a space that equalized and dignified each member. Um, and so I have a call to action. And this call to action is maybe non-traditional because I acknowledge how many teachers across the country are already doing this. And so our call to action is a trabajar. We know we have to center our students' lived experiences in order to ensure that research and practice aligns to our values of equity and justice. We got to get to work. We gotta make sure that the work connects deeply to teachers and supports them, not adds on one more thing. We need to make sure that we are consistently generous with our term of collaboration, meaning that we don't just stop at teacher to teacher collaboration, but we look at our greater community and know that this collaboration has a deep impact on student learning. Next, to quote Roberto Rodriguez, I know that he is going to be joining you all as well today. Um, I was really moved when he talked about this nuevo acuerdo, uh, compact between educators, government, policymakers to center educators because of this inherent trust that educators amplify student voices. Um, I think it's really critical for teachers to know that you are an expert and you are a leader from your classroom and that policymakers and leaders in education need to turn the ear to you um, and ask you the questions but that you, you don't have to worry about how policy gets made. Um, you have to just let them know what we need, what our students need. And a reminder to build bridges of courage. Um, I often say that courage on an individual level is finite and it can run out, especially when times are hard. But courage within community is infinite because we're constantly there to tap out, to give each other breaks, to support each other, um, to help each other keep going. So make sure that you continue to uh, be generous with your courage. Lastly, and most importantly, is this concept of disfrutar. We have to enjoy and celebrate the fruits of our labor, particularly when it has to do with our students' growth. So important, so critical that they find joy in um, this collective wellness and learning and before I let you go, I want to bring you back to this embrace. And I want to ask you to think about how can you today embrace educators to let them know that everything's going to be OK, that there's help on the horizon, that they're being listened to, um, that our work is really important and deeply respected. And before I say my final goodbyes, I want to share this moment that I had with my mother. I invited her to come to the garden um, to spend a day with the Nomis, with my students learning in the garden. And I know that my family's perseverance has become a part of my educational philosophy. And I'm so grateful to my mother for paving this path. So at the end of a very long day, I asked my mom, Mama, como ves? That literally translates into how do you see? But um, meaning wise, it means like, what do you think? How, how do you feel in this space? And my mother took a very long time to respond to me. But finally, she said to me, Julis, ¿cómo sí es posible cambiar? El mundo sí puede cambiar y todos podemos ayudar a cambiarlo. Look how it is possible to change. The world can change and we can help it change. So thank you all for being part of that change. Thank you all for believing in your impact and the power of collaboration. It's been an honor to join you all. Thank you all so much for joining us and um, coming together to really focus on how we can center teacher voice to improve policy and research for um, overall improvement in education. I'm really excited to have been part of it and to have been able to share a little bit about my work and my students. 
Um, I'm grateful to each one of you for the work that you do in advancing equity. And please stay connected and let me know if there's anything I can do to help you out in the future. Great. Well, there were so many um, notes that I certainly pulled away from Juliana's keynote. I think a, a couple that I would just highlight as we think about going into the rest of the day's conversation connected to our theme. Uh, the first is uh, there were a few things that she talked about. She talked about design frameworks for a more holistic uh, and inclusive education. Uh, and within that, I think that includes our research framework. Uh, for how we think about conducting and engaging in the questions that we ask uh, and how we go about conducting that research alongside the policy implications that come from it. Secondly, um, I think that she emphasized as one of her core values an asset orientation, referring to students um, not necessarily as English learners, which centers the, the majority language, but instead as linguistically gifted. I know that that's something that even in our own uh, event recruitment, uh, we did not well capture. And so I think um, as we think about the research and policy work that, that we have ahead to really support these students, um, wanting to make sure that we do approach that from an asset orientation. Oftentimes, we start out with a general frame, looking at aggregate data, and then only talk about these subpopulations of students um, as though they are um, separate and different um, and not in their own right um, worthy of, of being a primary object of um, study and import. And then uh, finally, this notion of a call to action, action uh, where our research and practice align with our core values. Uh, and, and I truly believe that the research and data work that um, a lot of our community engage in, if done well, can help illuminate those, um, those needs that Juliana uh, indicated that teachers need to express that they have, while also continuing to focus on their priority within the classroom setting. So I'm sure there were many other nuggets I see in the chat that uh, folks were really compelled by Juliana. And um, as we go throughout the uh, remainder of our sessions for today, I um, hope you'll continue to elevate her words, revisit them both in the discussion and in the chat.